what we're gonna do today is focus on the six digital eras. Now, when I built this a few years ago, it started with just three, er three eras, and it kept on growing. And the way this map works, and by the way, I put this on Twitter, if you wanted to retweet that, or also on Instagram, you can find it there, uh, it's, it's a map. Now, the way it works is, it starts at the first phase, and then it layers on more and more and more. One phase doesn't stop. It goes on top. They're sequential and they're additive. Now what's happening is they're actually increasing in frequency. It's happening at a faster pace. So this is something you can pin up. This is something you can put on your desk. And it also has my contact information. So congratulations, you now have the world's biggest business card. All right, and, and that's from Peter Shankman. He said, brand everything, so you got to listen to him. All right, so in each phase, uh, there's different questions. The first question is, in the uh, internet era, what happens when the world becomes digitized? The next phase is the social media era. What happens when people get information from each other? The third phase is the collaborative or sharing on-demand economy, uh, like Airbnb. What happens when people get the physical things in the world from each other? That's also peer-to-peer. Now we're entering the autonomous era. So these last, the last three are here and now. I'm gonna spend less time on them. The next phase is the autonomous world. What happens when the repetitive tasks in our lives become automated? There's some amazing things and some frightening things. Picking up on um, speakers yesterday who talked about this. And then the next phase, and Kate, thank you for setting the stage. Where's Kate? up oh, there, front and center, uh, are really around looking at the inner space. Inside of our minds and our bodies, technology is now impacting who we are as humans. And then looking at outer space, there's actually new technology that is enabling humans to go off planet at lower cost or launching satellites. I'll get to that in a sec. We're going to take one phase at a time. The first era is the internet era. Now, who here created a website in the 90s? Okay, there's a few early adopters. Now, if you remember, you had to have technical skills to code, and you probably had a server under your desk. Don't spill your coffee, the whole website would go down. And in this part of my career, I worked at Exodus Communications, which is the web host for all of the dot coms in Silicon Valley. And it was a pretty amazing time. I saw the rise of some really funny named uh, websites and startups emerged, and our company had five stock splits in one year, which is unheard of, and then the next year it went bankrupt. So <laughs> that's called the dot bomb era. So I experienced that firsthand in, in Silicon Valley. Now, making matters very clear in this era, you can see when one person talks, the whole internet can see whatever is being published. And there's at least two clear winners, Google and Amazon have really dominated the space. Google organizes the world's information, and then Amazon has sorted out uh, retail for a big part of this. Now, I uh, want to just preface, many, much of my presentation it has a Silicon Valley uh, lens. That's where I live, and that also impacts Europe as well. What I don't have represented as well is, is Asia, and there's a whole other piece to that. In fact, by the way, there's two internets, you know? There's the Western world, and then there's China. There's two different internets, and they're going to clash and battle, and that's happening right now. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this era. We already know it. it's, it's here, and it's already come and passed, and we already know the dominant players. So the next space is around the social media era, and we had some wonderful speakers yesterday, and we have some wonderful speakers today that will address this in more detail, but essentially you can see this now people can share their information with each other peer to peer and this disrupts politicians and marketers and media and press and pr all of those organizations were disrupted because they thought they controlled the message but now it's been democratized peer to peer this is a graph of uh, adoption of of social media and essentially it's very very high wherever there's internet adoption it's a pretty basic thing to understand but there's been a lot of downsides this is Mark Zuckerberg. He was dragged in front of Congress, and there's a lot of concerns around how is that information being used. All of that social media content that I see you guys creating yesterday and today, where, where is that data going? Where is the server? How is it being used? We don't really even know. 
What's interesting is I saw something uh, to yesterday is there's a brand called uh, CrossFit. Do you guys know CrossFit? Okay. I am a customer member. I'm part of the cult, I mean community. Uh, and um, it's a, it, they actually decided to delete their entire accounts on Facebook and Instagram, CrossFit corporate. They have six million followers. They deleted them yesterday because they're furious on how the content is being used. They want to see proper regulation. They don't like that things are being turned on and off in privacy settings. They have no control. So it's kind of like I'm expecting other brands that have strong values to maybe even leave Facebook and Instagram. Brands like Ben and Jerry's or nonprofits. Uh, we're going to see some changes. I think that's just the start of this avalanche. So I'm here to point out the good things and the bad things in all of these eras. I want to give you the realistic look. Uh, my role as an industry analyst is to say how it really is, not just promote these technologies. Because as you know, this can end up in some dangerous spaces for all of us. All right, so the next era, and here we are now, is this collaborative economy or sharing space. So I was looking online last night. There's a number of Airbnbs locations here in Montenegro. I don't see Uber, that's unfortunate, but there's ways that people can get what they need from each other. Now, it's not just the physical things like space and transportation, it's also money. Blockchain or crowdfunding or cryptocurrencies, those are all peer-to-peer -peer, uh, pieces that happen. In fact, a few years ago, I mapped this whole market out. Hopefully, you're seeing the trend in me. I like to organize things into discrete, clear ways. And if you want this graphic, the full high-res version, just search for Collaborative Economy Honeycomb 3. There's three versions. And essentially, there's, I think this is 16 different industries that are now enabling peer-to-peer -peer content. So there's uh, co-working leaders here. What's, uh, what's the name of your co-working spot? Beta Bar. OK. Are there other co-working spots? I, I think I just saw one down next to the submarine. Uh, so this is a way of sharing your physical space. But it's not just space. The, the clear trend that I see right now, and this is an opportunity, even if Uber is not allowed here, is micromobility is the big trend that we're seeing in many different cities. And this is electric scooters or regular scooters. A, a very industrious entrepreneur here in the room could develop a micromobility service and do it for Montenegro, specifically within cities. And this is an opportunity to do it fast before the other large companies move in. And essentially, you could borrow somebody's scooter or you could rent a scooter from a service rather than own it outright. And there's actually a whole economy that emerges of somebody that goes around and they charge these things and they put them back in the street and they're called uh, bird hunters. That's one of the name of the, of the startups. It's called Bird. So it actually created its own economy uh, that enabled people for these micro mobilities. The rate of people participating in what we call the gig economy, where they're sharing time. How many of you have heard of Upwork? Okay, most of the room. How many of you are using Upwork? You're offering your services or you're, or you're purchasing it. Okay, very few hands. This is a wonderful opportunity if you have marketing skills, market research skills, software development, project management, uh, all of those content creation skills, um, these SEO, SEM, you can offer your services anywhere to any buyer around the globe and charge global-based rates. And you don't have to leave this beautiful country. So these, this is a way to use these services from wherever you are. I think this is an opportunity. So the rate of uh, adoption for these are only increasing. Uh, th this is the gig economy. And there's many forecasts that indicate that the millennials, and I saw most of the room is millennials under 30, and Peter had to teach you guys what a Rolodex was and some other things like a VCR and a TV and a TV. Uh, but essentially, we see the forecast that around 50% of the millennials within a few years will be in this economy, and this will be the primary way that they do business. They do not want a full-time job. This is the way you can live your life the way you want to on your terms using technology. Now, this has become a massive market. I tallied up the IPOs for these startups, and most of them are in this collaborative economy space, and there has been billions of dollars of these companies. So this is a tremendous red-hot market that's enabling people to get what they need from each other. 
And if you don't see these services here in Montenegro, this is an opportunity. I, I remember yesterday, they asked how many people are entrepreneurs, and I saw about 10 hands go up. Let me try it again, let's see if it's changed. How many of you are entrepreneurs? Wow, there's some inspiration, more hands went up. Um, but in the back of the room, I didn't see a lot of hands. Uh, but you don't need to be an entrepreneur and quit your job. This is something you can do on the side. I started to build my companies on the side when I had a full-time job, and then I had enough resources and I got traction, I had a go-to-market plan, then I was able to launch these companies. So all of you can be entrepreneurs. I think that's the point of the internet is to enable each and every one of you guys to actually find that path. Let's talk about the next era. I'm gonna spend more time on these eras because they're looking forward into the future. The next era is called the autonomous world. And you can see these icons, it's changed. In the prior icons, it was humans exchanging goods or mobility or services or money. But now it's different. This is the one that gets people a little upset. You know, I want to just coach you. There's opportunities and threats. I want you to hear them both now, okay? So you can see at the bottom, there's drones delivering things. I saw a drone on the waterfront. Somebody was taking a drone, a selfie with a drone. Uh, and then there's self-driving cars where these things are delivering people in packages. And at the top is this all-seeing eye, which represents an artificial intelligence that's using the tremendous amount of data that it's gathering to learn about us. How many of you guys have trained your AI today? Just curious. Any hands? One hand. Did anybody today use Google? Facebook? Email? Ah, great. You've all been training your AI today. It's listening and learning to what your preferences are. It's matching your data set with other people that are similar to you. And then it's going to predict what you need. These things are unfolding now. These tech companies don't really tell us how deep it goes. They're afraid to scare us, but they go pretty deep. Let's take a look. This autonomous world age. And notice on the sides of the triangle, it's the robots and the autonomous technologies, and the inside are the people and the packages that are now being transported. The labor has shifted to the robots. So Jason Miller did a great job yesterday talking about how AI and creativity work hand in hand, and he's right. That human creativity is the key thing. That will not be outsourced anytime soon. But the thing that will be automated, and this is important, Anything that is repeated over and over, any repetitive task is going to be automated. Anything that is repeated, oh, and I guess I'm repeating myself, so I'm gonna be automated, oh shit. Um, anything that is repeated over and over is going to be automated. So think about in your day, what is the task that you're doing over and over every single day or weekly? Those will become automated. You wanna get rid of that as fast as you can or you wanna build a software program or a robot to do that for you and then you can monetize and help other people. Think really carefully about what can be automated and make sure it's not you. Last week in San Francisco, I visited Cruise. Cruise is a fleet of self-driving cars and they are rolling around Silicon Valley. Um, Tesla has self-driving cars. It's very normal in Silicon Valley to see self-driving cars. It's, it used to be shocking three or four years ago. Nobody cares now. It's, it's a, become a common occurrence that you would see. Now, there's a human behind every vehicle as a safety measure, and that's required by law. But over time, they will move into the side seat and then eventually the back seat, and eventually there will be no steering wheel at all. So Cruise is uh, by General Motors. They're funded in part by them and uh, amongst other companies. And it's a, they have LIDAR and radar and sensors and video cameras on the vehicle, and it's able to figure out where it's going. So that's coming. That's very exciting. One of the leading cause of deaths, age 25 to 40, is deaths from vehicles. And uh, I have, we have a lot of friends here from London. I believe the amount of time people spend looking for parking is almost equivalent to the amount of time they're actually driving. So the way we can use self-driving cars as a service, maybe it's provided by the government, maybe it's provided by tech services, maybe it's a car that you own and it's out making money for you during the day. Oh yeah, I did a, a TED talk 
um, at the Frankfurt Auto Show, and they asked for people to come up with a, a vision for the future. And, and my vision is that these cars will become like they're alive. Uh, for example, it'll connect to your social networking um, data, and it'll know what mood you are. So when you get in the car, it'll have that music for that mood. And it's going to know, um, carry what your search engine results are, the things that you like. And it's going to surprise you and take you on a date to a restaurant that you didn't know that you're going to like. It's also going to pick up the groceries, the eggs, and the milk for you when you're at work. And if you own this car, it could actually generate revenue for you during the day, driving other people around. It's like it's going to work. And then it needs to upgrade itself like it goes to college and downloads the latest patch. And then it wants to uh, get a new entertainment system by using the money that it earned. So it's like it got a university degree and it's, it, it's growing. And at the very highest level, uh, imagine it's being used 90% of the time. It has generated enough revenue, it knows it needs to reproduce itself. It actually can purchase another car and then it grows its fleet on its own. So the theory, the thesis that I have is these self-driving cars will eventually look like a living species that we create moving around the planet. I saw this out of Oakland. This is a self-driving bodega. It's an actual store. And they're just prototyping it. This is a Photoshop of what it could be. But essentially, we'll have produce, and it'll have a refrigerator on board. And you summon it, and you come outside of your house, and you pick all the produce that you want, and then it goes away. And it has cameras to see what you want and what you picked up, and it's, all tr it's a seamless transaction. So the stores will come to you in this future sense. Now, what about chatbots and AI? Uh, this graph shows there's a difference between generations. The younger generations are expecting chatbots to be one of the first level of response. They want to talk to these bots. This is the first thing that we see. And so the expectation for speed, 24 by 7 um, experience, and maybe they don't want to talk to a human. They want to talk to a technology as faster and more efficient. So the expectations now are that we deliver these autonomous experiences. In San Francisco, I went to the Amazon Go store. Do you guys, have you heard about this? Okay, so it's an app that you download, Amazon Go, and then you also connect it to your Amazon account, and so you have a seamless payment system. You walk into the store, you scan your phone on the, the kiosk, the door opens up, and you go inside. You grab whatever you want off the shelf, put it into a bag, and you can actually take the products off the shelf and put it into your backpack. And then I felt so guilty because I walked out and I felt I thought I was stealing something. They're like, go ahead, go ahead and go. I was like, well, how would they know? Well, it's really interesting. When you go into an Amazon Go store, you have to remember to look up because all the robots are looking down at you. They're watching your whole behavior set. Now, here's the thing. And for any of those that are in marketing, there is no more hiding. There is no more bluffing. There is no more poker face. These cameras can see the, the intricate changes in your faces. The micro expressions, there's 110 micro expressions. So when you see a piece of chocolate that you think you might like, your eyes, your retina will change, and it'll see that, and it'll know that. And so it'll record that information, and next time, maybe that product will go on discount. So it's looking at your face and recording and your gestures, all of those things. Swiss Post, one of my clients formerly, they are experimenting with drones for delivery. It's a, um, a logistics company. And uh, obviously, aerial drones makes a lot of sense in mountainous territory. This could also work here in Montenegro as well. So imagining using drones to deliver things quickly all around the country. And they also are experimenting with Starship, which is the six-legged drone. I actually got to drive one, but it's also autonomous. And what they do is during the lunch break, they are going to restaurants, picking up the hot food, and they drive it somewhere else in an urban city, and they deliver that food. It has six wheels because the front two wheels pop up so it can get over a curb uh, in an urban location and then it can crawl back down. Now, they're required to have a human be present and observe it to make sure nobody messes with it and there's just safety. And it's kind of interesting to see, like, the bot is moving along by itself, this droid, and there's a human following it. It's like the, the bot is walking a dog, which happens to be a human. It's the weirdest thing to see. It's also based upon logistics. This is Tally. I've seen this robot, and it goes through the aisles, 
in the retail location and it scans all of the, the visual locations of the products and then it says what type of product needs to be updated and put back on the shelf and it sends a signal through the supply chain. So this is an example of using this for the operations side and I'm seeing a variety of these types of technologies emerge. It's a wild era. Now, if you're feeling a little bit concerned, I want to make sure you see there's opportunity as well. The, the vision that I hear, and I don't know if this is true, frankly, it's, it's cloudy, but the opportunity is that humans no longer need to labor. Humans no longer need to do the things that we really weren't meant to do on the planet. But instead, we can do the higher order things, like the things Kate was talking about, about being with our families, being connected, being grounded to ourselves, focusing on the arts and the media. Obviously, you guys know music with a crescendo. So what if we spent more time? There's, there's probably some G, uh, Da Vinci artists in here. There's some great Beethovens here in the room or in, in the country that haven't been unlocked because they're forced into labor. The opportunity is to use these technologies to automate these lower end things in order to provide more resources for the planet. That's the vision. But I want to pull the room real, really quick. All right. So how many of you, first question with a show of hands, how many of you, raise your hand if you think automation will replace human jobs? Just about every uh, hand is up. All right, so I would say about 90% of the room. Now here's the second question, and I want you to, uh, well, let's see the hands. How many of you think your job will be automated? Why do I only see 10 hands? See, that is such a great opportunity for self-reflection. <laughs> we think that guy's job's going to get automated or that gal's job's going to be, but it's not going to be me because I am special. <laughs> mm. Okay. So that's the autonomous world era. Now let's go on to the fifth era. You guys getting excited? Now we're going to go into inner space, looking inside of us. Modern well-being. Also, I call it tech wellness or uh, well tech, wellness tech. And basically everything in our, our minds and bodies, in our communities, in our spaces, are becoming digitized. And this is so exciting, yet so fucking scary at the same time. Do you really want Apple and Google and Facebook inside of your brain? My friend Amber Case says that we're already like androids. Uh, we're already, I'm sorry, we're already cyborgs. If I take your phone from you and I walk away with it, you're gonna feel anxious. Um, we're already having these experiences where we have the phantom vibration happening where we think that the phone is ringing but it's not. Okay, so let me, let, let's try this, uh, this test here. Am I talking about an infant or am I talking about your phone, ready? You longingly stare into it. It's hungry, you have to feed it. It's calling for you, you run to it. You hold it until you fall asleep. Which one am I talking about? <sighs> both. Yes, both. Um, it's actually sad though because, so I have uh, young children and these young children, and many others, not just myself, are already growing up competing with that mobile phone, that smartphone. They already see it in the parents' hands. They're already competing for attention with it. All right, so here is we, here's us, this Vitruvian person, borrowing from da Vinci on the Adriatic. And what's happening is we're being surrounded by technologies, whether it's AR, mixed reality, big data, devices like this Apple Watch, virtual reality, social networks, mobile devices, the sensors, cameras, drones, self-driving cars, whatever it is. And it's integrating into four aspects of our lives. At the top, it's going into our minds. We're seeing, I'll show you some examples in a sec. Uh, from mindfulness software to attention limiting uh, uh, screen time management to meditation software and then our body everything's being quantified the latest technology is breath tech I'll show you an example in a second um, obviously our fitness and our activities being tracked 
Peter and I did a run yesterday. It was great. We tracked all of our data and location. And then community. By the way, when you look at who lives the longest on the planet, and there's been multiple studies, it's not the person who's on paleo or doing CrossFit. It's the person who has their loved ones around them. They actually live longer. So community is actually the key, key thing. And then next is the physical space around us our offices, our cars, our homes, the third space, the cafe, technology is being integrated. How many of you have an Alexa at home or a Google Home, some type of assistant? So imagine like 10 years ago, like, God, no, I don't want to have Big Brother in my home, and now we just, but today we welcome these things in. It's a common occurrence. All right, so I plotted this, and there's 500 startups in this space. This is only the top 100, and you can find this on my blog, the full res version. And we segmented it out, and uh, by the way, you can see the pattern again. I like to organize things. Uh, you should see my closet. It is dope. Um, and essentially, all of these startups are aligned by these different categories. Let's take a look. Actually, um, Jason Miller mentioned Wobot yesterday, but here's the actual screenshot. Wobot is a digital therapist. Now, we, we found in our research that millennials, in particular teen girls, we're more likely to tell Alexa things as their best friend than a human. And this is so amazing and frightening at the same time. But there's also these apps like Wobot. And you can talk to it and it uses natural language processing and gives you different choices. And it will check in with you, how are you feeling? And if you're feeling sad or down or glum, you can actually talk to it and it'll say, how are you doing? And it'll teach you skills on how to, to center yourself. Uh, things that Kate was talking about yesterday. But now it's being done by an AI therapist. Now, why are people turning to this? Well, number one, it's there 24 by 7. If you're depressed in the middle of the night, you can't call anybody, really. Secondly, it's free, if not cheap. And the third one is, this is the critical one, there's no judgment. There's no judgment from an AI bot. It's not going to look down on you. The next category is mindfulness software. Has anybody tried Calm or Headspace? Quite a few hands. Um, I interviewed both of them. So Headspace is to help you focus. By the way, there's, there's two outcomes of this software. It is focus, and the other one is to be calm, hence the name of the other product. So mindfulness software, it's being used by HR departments and corporate. The, the NBA Basketball League in the United States has a corporate account with Headspace. It's in the back of airlines in the headrests. Hotels are running, um, deploying these as well. Now, Calm, on the other hand, is to help you relax. And their target market is women 25 to 40. Busy moms with careers, uh, and they want to get away from all the craziness, including tech. So they turn to tech in order to fall asleep. The irony in that, we're turning to tech to get away from tech. Now, Calm is invested in spas. They're launching a hotel. They actually have coloring books, which I did at dinner with some of the speakers last night, which is a very therapeutic thing to do. And they even have um, different sprays so it can help you fall asleep. So they're trying multiple modes in order to help people relax. We're so stressed out. I remember yesterday, uh, there was a speaker who asked, how many of you feel uh, stressed out more in the last three years? And I think everybody raised their hand. So this is why we see these companies becoming uh, worth billions of dollars. Another startup that is not well known is called Luna. It's the, the Uber, the on-demand version of physical therapist in Silicon Valley. And I know the CEO, and it's growing incredibly fast. So apparently, the physical therapist locations in the United States are very poor. They're dimly lit. They're, it's hard to schedule. It, it, they're not very good. And so instead of going to those locations, they're reducing their prices, and those physical therapists are coming to your home. So for the entrepreneurs in the room, Think about any time you have to go to a store or go to, go to a service around wellness or anything, instead build an on-demand app and have those things come to you. That's the opportunity for you. <clears throat> Let's talk about Breath Tech. This is an Israeli company. It was the darling of CES. And essentially, it's a device that you breathe into, and it measures how many ketones are in your breath. Now, ketones are the measurement of your breath fat coming out as carbon and other things in your breath. And it's able to determine, are you actually losing weight? This is a problem in America. You guys all look great, by the way. Um, 
we're bigger in the U.S. And, and uh, I heard you guys don't have a McDonald's yet, but as soon as you do, you're going to need a Lumen because you're going to uh, gain, gain weight like the American diet. So this is a big issue in the United States. So when you breathe into it, it's going to tell you, oh, I'm finally correctly fasting and my body is burning fat. The business model for this is brilliant. It's actually a food service they're going to launch. And they're going to tell you when to eat, what to eat, and how much to eat. So that's a very smart play. Uh, we haven't tested it yet, so we're waiting to see how real this is. Now, it's, this, it's not just consumer tech. It's also for businesses. This is a company that measures the quality of wellness in business offices. And they have a criteria list from the lighting to the quality of the air, the quality of the water. Are there places for people to celebrate? Are there places for people to rest? Is there meditation rooms and yoga rooms? So they look for all of these criteria and actually rate the quality of a building or an office or a company. So that's the fifth era that's called modern well-being. Tech is now coming into our minds, bodies, communities, and physical spaces. I showed you some examples. And now, finally, for this last one. Now, I want to apologize. I feel a little bit vulnerable with this one because I don't really know what's happening. And it's, it's a very cloudy future. It, it's on the horizon, but I wanted to publish this. By the way, this is the first time I'm presenting this in public for the sixth era, but, but I'm seeing it turn up really fast. So I'm open to your feedback later. Um, but essentially, we're going to go off planet. Now, now, hold on. None of you are going to Mars. I'm not going to Mars. Uh, well, maybe some of you are. Uh, you're going to Mars. Awesome. You're, you're there already? Mm. Thank you, Johanna. All right. Um, but essentially what we're seeing is the first step is called CubeSats. Does Montenegro have a CubeSat that's been launched? Not yet? So that is another opportunity for an entrepreneur. There, there are small satellites, low-cost sensors, and, you, and countries all over the, the world bulk them up, and they go onto a private spaceship, and they're launched into orbit at low cost. It's like the sharing economy for satellites. And essentially what we're seeing as the first phase, we're not talking about lunar colonization or space, we're just talking about satellites as a service. Now, I'm not talking about drones flying over our heads. That's low level. What I'm talking about is satellite imagery that all of us uh, can access. And it's not just a database like Google Maps that's updated every few years. I'm talking about daily on-demand imagery of everything that we're all going to have access to. And it's going to be affordable. So for example, we could see the tulips blooming in the Netherlands. Or we could see the construction of the Apple campus headquarters in real time. Or we might see the destruction, unfortunately, of the Great Barrier Reef and understand who's actually messing it up. Or we could watch the Grand Canyon and see how the water's flowing inside. But, but so what? What is the uses? What's, what's so great about that? Well, the uses for this are very interesting. You could use a satellite to watch over your house at night. And by the way, they have infrared and radar, so they can see even at nighttime. If you're going to do a long hike, and some of us are going on a, a boat ride tomorrow, it can track us as we're moving around, and just to make sure we're safe. You could check out traffic patterns in the neighborhood before you buy a house. Or you could look at the microclimate of a new location before you go to a place. It can see through smoke and vegetation and clouds. These satellites can already do. So you can access the crop health. And if you have partners, I mean, where does your food come from? Not all of it comes from Montenegro. Don't you want to know the quality of the source of your food? What's the quality of it? We don't know, right? We don't really know where all of our food comes from. That's the global food chain. But now you can evaluate which crops are actually moving faster. And if there is a catastrophe, and I, I, and I knock on wood, it doesn't happen to anybody, but you could use these things to look through debris and smoke and find people and access structural damage and use this information. But also for business trends, you could track the growth. And I heard there's a number of roads that are being developed here, some by Chinese investors. Now you could track in real time, how fast is that moving? You could also track your neighbors in other countries, how fast are they doing this? Or if you have a business, you can track your competitors. 
How many trucks are moving in and out of your competitor's business? How fast are they growing? How many people are walking into the building and out? If you don't do that, your competitor's gonna do it on your business. So you kind of have to at this point. And so you can measure all these different flows. We can even find out, and I think this one's really important, who's actually polluting the most in the planet and hiding it. So we can look at real emissions all around the globe and it's like we have a view. So that all sounds very science fiction. Let me ground this on who's actually doing this right now. Amazon is. I spent time with the Amazon uh, Web Services team last week and they have something called Ground Station. And Ground Station is a satellite dish on the ground and it's getting the data from different satellites and the data is going back and forth and they're uploading that content to Amazon Cloud Services. So if you already have an Amazon Cloud Services account, you can already, well, not yet, this is not launched yet, but you will be able to access some of this satellite data. This is coming. So think about all the business opportunities in Montenegro to unleash this satellite data. We have some smart folks in this room. You guys can come together and think about what could be done. There's another startup called Planet Labs. They're doing the similar thing to collect that data using satellites, so it's another player in the space. Now let's talk about going off planet. Obviously there's SpaceX. They have a number of tests that are happening uh, and they are launching quickly and we're hearing some amazing things with the vertical takeoff and landing. And they have visions to actually get these things to get humans and they want to colonize off planet. Now I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'm really not qualified. So I really want to be humble and show some humility. I, not an astronaut, you had an astronaut last year to, to speak and I am certainly not that. But I do love this quote from Jeff Bezos uh, and this was from a few months ago. I, I, I meet with CEOs once in a while and they have visions like, yes, we wanna own the share of, of wallet or the share of stomach of all these food drinks and stuff and that's their big vision. But this is a big vision. Jeff Bezos says, Right now, there's 7.5 billion people on this planet, but he says if we can colonize the solar system, there could be one trillion humans in the solar system. That's a pretty big vision. That's a huge vision. Now, if you watch Twitter carefully, he is arguing with Elon Musk about that, and they're fighting about this, and this is wonderful to see competition from the private sector on who's gonna actually do this. So the point of this last era, and again, it's cloudy. I don't quite see all of it, but I wanted to bring it to you now so you could be the first movers here, is starting with satellites as service is the first play. And so this is the six eras. Now, let me summarize this, and we'll talk about what you can do in your company. So the questions, and I asked this question for the first one in the, in the internet era, is when the physical world becomes digitized, it means the power shifts to the companies that actually did the digitization. I think we already know this story. Now, when the world embraces social media and people get information from each other, that also shifts power to the people. Same thing happened with the collaborative economy. Society becomes more efficient. We have less waste. We're sharing more of the same items. We can share homes, co-working spots. We can share cars, bicycles, and scooters. But we've already seen the power shifted to the tech startups that are leading this. That's the one thing that I do want to make sure that you hear this very carefully. So I, I come from Silicon Valley where these platforms and marketplaces exist. And Silicon Valley is profiting from this. Uh, I encourage you to build your own platforms. Don't just rely on the ones in Silicon Valley because the power is shifting over there. You guys got to build your own. You need to, to develop these software pieces because the data flows somewhere else and whoever has the data gets to monetize it. So that's a really important message I want you to hear. The next one is the autonomous world. Yes, human tasks will become automated, but the promise is that the shitty tasks are gonna be automated, the ones that we don't wanna do, the laborious ones, the boring ones. But it's really gonna leave some questions around what are we, what is humanity? And we don't really know what this looks like. So that's an open question. Next is modern well-being, inner space. These technologies are going to help us and quantify our brains and humans. The end result is there is very little difference between tech and a human. We're already becoming like cyborgs. Remember the infant versus smartphone analogies that I gave? We're already experiencing this. There's not gonna be any difference between those, the human, the, the biological sense and the digital carbon sense. They're all tied in silicone. Carbon and silicone are all one. 
And then lastly, is leaving Earth is becoming more affordable, starting with simple satellites and then data as a service. And it means everybody has God view, like a video game. We all are going to have God view over Montenegro, the Balkans, Europe, Asia, the planet. We're all going to have that capability, and that's going to create incredible transparency and hopefully open up avenues of trust, but it's going to decrease privacy. It's inevitable. Now, how many of you work at big companies? I'm curious. Okay, about a quarter. How many of you work at mid-sized companies? All right, uh, a few more. So I wanted to give some examples of what you can do in your company, and then we'll start some Q&A. And what we found is, this is from our research on corporate innovation. I'm switching gears a little bit to make sure you can activate these six trends inside of your company. Um, Cisco did analysis to find out what are the top performing teams based upon their revenue output, and they found that employees that play to their strengths have the same values and enable trust those were the groups that were succeeding, and they looked, looked across hundreds of different places. Another example that I'm seeing when it comes to innovation is to come up and allow all of your employees to come up with ideas. This is called intrapreneurship rather than entrepreneurship. And Adobe has a class where any employee can take a class and learn how to be like a product manager and come up with ideas. And the employees are given this box after they take the class. And it has the diagrams and the contact information, a Gatorade, a power bar, and a credit card with a thousand US dollars on it. And they encourage you, off you go, and you try your experiments. A large bank, which is struggling, called Wells Fargo, they are enabling innovation by allowing startups to integrate with their own products. So not all of the innovation needs to happen within your company you should partner with the startups. And many of the, at the startup competition yesterday, figure out how to partner with them in an open ecosystem. Speaking of which, Johnson & Johnson has these labs where startups can actually go in and work with them and partner. They even allow competitive startups that compete with J&J &J to actually work with them. And their belief is, if we can get all of the boats to rise, then we will win as, as well. The last example I have is, MasterCard, their CEO, believes in innovation, and he said that the innovation group will have a budget, even if the company has negative performance financially. There's always going to be a dedicated budget for funding innovation. So it's not just something you do when your company's doing well. Innovation is something you're doing all of the time, and innovation is doing something new constantly. So thank you. We went through a lot. We talked about the six digital eras, and I will give you a summary of all these things, and this graphic as well is on, the, on my tweet and Instagram. So let's talk about those phases. The first two phases, the internet phase and the social media phase, phase one and phase two, those caused significant shifts in the way we got information and retail and e-commerce. That's already come and gone. We've, that's already a mature. The next phase, the collaborative economy or sharing economy, on-demand economy, that's, starting, that's pretty dominant now and growing. And quickly, that births the next phase, the autonomous world. It basically means that the world becomes more efficient and we move faster. We save resources, we share resources. Get ready, looking towards the future modern well-being, looking at the inner space as technology integrates with our mind and our bodies. That's next. And then we go off-planet with satellite data, which is going to happen within this next year. So that's what you need to get ready for. That's looking into the future. So we kind of see what is in the, well, it's not in the past. It's here, what's developing, and what's in the future. That's how I see them. You can group those in kind of two, uh, sorry, three different groups of two each. And I gave you a few examples very quickly of innovation. And that's doing something new that you haven't done before. And it could be in conflict with the way you're doing business right now. But it's key we always innovate. So use this map for your business and for your career. And I want you to blaze your path forward. Thank you so much. That's the six digital Bravo. Thank you.